It ain't easy being a person who has an English degree and being a terrible speller. I say this with all confidence because, well, that's how I live my life. I've never been a great speller. I don't exactly know why. I have a couple different theories about why that is, but it's something that's haunted me my entire life. It's also incredibly difficult when a majority of your friends also have degrees in English, and when you live far apart, how do we communicate with one another via text and via social media? And so nine times out of ten, my good friend, my best friend, will correct my spell. And I will get hot in the face and frustrated because I am not a good speller. And he likes to remind me of that. However, I do hold this against him, see, because once again, he is also someone who studied English. And as we were talking one day, a very interesting thing happened. We were speaking about famous uh, poet laureate Maya Angelou and about why the caged bird sings and all that real boring, nerdy English stuff, if you will. And he managed to confuse her with an actress named Maya Rudolph, who does not have the distinguished poet career that Maya Angelou does, but was instead an actress on Saturday Night Live. People don't forget. I haven't forgotten. And so when he goes to correct my spelling, I always like to point out, well, at least I know my famous poets better than you. And so he can get red in the face and get frustrated. And it's all in good fun, I assure you, it's all in good fun. But the idea behind it is it, it makes me think about something. It makes me think about what it means to actually be humble. You see, when you know your own flaws, when you know that you're not great at something, when you understand who and what you are, when you are bestowed grace upon you, when you are bestowed a gift upon you, it feels different. There's a certain weight of it all when you realize who you are and that, you know, what is it people always say? Oh, I don't deserve this. And that's how we feel. And this is actually what grace is. When we think about what grace is, grace is us constantly looking at God and saying, but I don't deserve this. You see, the scriptures remind us very clearly what? That we are all sinners. And this in and of itself is a problem because in most churches, there are two different ways to look at sin. The first is it's either harped and harped and harped and harped on until you're taken and beaten down and you feel just horrible about yourself and you have nothing to do but to turn to Jesus. The other is to ignore it completely. And you never talk about sin. You only focus on the good things, about how much God loves you, and worship becomes all about these nice, warm, fuzzy feelings and lattes and all these wonderful things that people can do when they come near to God. And that discounts the fact that we are all sinners. So most people have this hard thing to do when it comes to talking about sin, but you have to talk about sin in a sermon like this because it is the exact center of the entire point of staying humble. Because the fact of the matter is, whether we want to admit it or not, and this ain't me harping on you, the fact is, we're all sinners. And if you have a problem with that, then you have a problem with numerous lines of Scripture. Now again, this is not meant to harp and to beat down. I'm not the turn and burn guy. It's meant to show us who we are and what we are about. And this was the problem that Jeremiah was addressing. See, Jeremiah was speaking to the Israelites. And the way that this passage is sort of set up, it's almost like this courtroom drama 
with God on the one side telling the people, this is what I've done and this is what you've done. Jeremiah's case against the Israelites is so powerful because the structure of the argument itself. He starts off talking, saying, look at all of the things that I have done. You know, God says, I have not once asked for too much of anything. I brought you out of Egypt as slaves. I took you from a horrible situation. I picked you up. I carried you with my own self to this land. I helped you defeat your enemies. I gave you food to eat. I gave you drink to drink. All of these things I have done. Not because you people necessarily deserved it, but because I love you. This is the crux of the case that God is laying out against the Israelites. He says, and what have you people done? He said, where's God? He said, we're going to follow Baal. We want to switch gods now. We want the cooler, faster, newer model. And God looks at this and is just like, are you, are you kidding me right now? The entire history of the people of God has hinged upon God's action. There would be no people for Jeremiah to tell this message to had God not intervened in their life. God says the people committed two evils. They forsook God, the God who gave them water, and they tried to do things their own way. He says, you dug out cisterns for yourselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. This is the people getting haughty. This is the people having a big head saying, eh, I think I can handle this. Forgetting their place, forgetting who they are and what they're really all about. Because if they remembered everything about their history, they would understand, they would remember, they would recall that God has taken them all of these places. That God has walked with them, that God has guided them. But instead, what happened? As soon as things got good, as soon as they were established, what did the people do? They're like, look at how awesome I am. Look at all of the things I have done. And I want to do this. They have forgotten that without God, they would not be where they are. They had forgotten who exactly God is and what exactly God had done for them. But God remembers. God remembers the exodus. God remembers carrying them through the desert. God remembers the promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. God remembers creation itself. All of these things set in motion to get these people to be where they are. This is what God remembers and this is what the people have forgotten. They forgot and they get too big for their britches. They get haughty and they get all sort of self-important. And they think they can do things on their own. They're not humble. And when you're humble, when you're actually humble, you can't help but feel the weight of the gift that has been given. And this isn't God trying to say, you're horrible, evil, dirty, rotten sinners. No, far from it. This is God simply saying, Hey, this relationship is a little bit off here. He's like, you know, God's like, according to these standards, according to these rules of which you have broken, you are deserving of punishment. You are deserving of things that are not good. Something we can do about this? How can we work this out? Because if you'll remember, I forgave all your sins. I carried you when you could not walk. I have done all of these things for you. 
And God says, I'm not asking for a lot. God says, just remember. Remember what happened and be grateful. Be thankful. But humility is a hard thing because humility is what keeps us grounded. Humility is what helps us to understand who we are. And that's not a fun thing because we want to be the best. That's what our culture says. Be the best. Have the fastest. Do the most things. Do all of these things. Get all of these things. You know, we live in a nation where we have so much stuff. What do we do? We buy places outside of our homes where our stuff is stored to store more stuff. Instead of saying, eh, maybe I don't need that. We accumulate wealth and we accumulate all of these things as if we're not grateful. You know what happens every time a new iPhone comes out? You look at your old phone, which is what, a year old, and you're like, I don't want to play with you anymore. I need this one because it's a little bit faster and the camera's a little bit better and it costs a lot more money. And we think that that means we have to have it. Instead of just having the old reliable brick Nokia that you could drop on the floor and dig it out of the crater that it created. We want to be the best because we forget we're not the best. We don't have all the answers. I think this is part of the crux of what Jesus is trying to talk about in the parable from Luke today. People get too big for their britches. They want what they think they deserve. And the, the truth of the matter is, we're not owed anything. We're not owed a whole bunch of stuff. And so Jesus is at this party at this Pharisee's house, and he's watching people jockey for position, getting the best seats at this dinner table. Certain seats, certain places where you were, it meant you had this elevated status. You know, sitting on the right hand, sitting on the left hand, sitting close to the host. All of these things uh, meant that you were this big, important hot shot. And people jockey for those positions. And Jesus looks at all of this. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't call anybody out by name. And as he's watching this, he says, I'm going to tell you all a story. And he tells a story about a guy who goes to a wedding banquet, a feast, much like a feast they are. And he says, if you want to go to a wedding, that's great, but don't sit in the best seat. Don't sit in the, think, don't, don't sit in the seat that you think you deserve. Because what's going to happen is if someone who's more deserving of the seat comes up to you, you're going to look like a putz because the host is going to say, yeah, you're going to have to move. And then you're going to have to go to the lowest seat with the least honor. And you're just going to feel silly about yourself. He said, instead, the way to do it is this. Sit at the lowest seat to begin with. Sit in the spot no one else wants to spot. And then when the host sees you and says, oh, no, you shouldn't be sitting there, come up here. That's what you do. Because you're not taking honor for yourself. You are given this honor, just as God has given us honor, just as God has treated us with dignity, just as God has treated us with respect. That's how you live your life. You be humble. You stay humble. You stay grounded and you stay focused. He goes on to say there's this other component with it. Like, you know, whenever you have a party, don't invite all the rich people. Don't invite your friends or your family. Because here's what happens. Jesus understands and Jesus sees the social contract that is involved in these parties. And we see that too. We see it today. Because what happens when someone gets you something for Christmas 
or for your birthday. One of the things I, 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 I loathe about birthdays is the social obligation you have now to write on someone's Facebook wall. Because then you have to try to remember, okay, did they write on my wall? Do I need to write on their wall? Like, how does this work out? Or if someone gets you a gift, you have this obligation then to give them a gift. Because you have to fulfill this social contract. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. He says, look, if you invite the rich people, if you invite the wealthy, if you invite your friends and family, what's going to happen? The next time they have a banquet, they're going to say, oh, Jim Bob invited me to their party, so now I have to reciprocate and invite them to my party. And in that way, the debt is paid. As if being nice and kind or generous is this sort of weight measurement balancing system. He says, Jesus says, you haven't gained anything in this transaction. All you've done is you've been repaid for your hospitality. He says, look, you want to be hospitable? That's great. That's perfect. That's wonderful. Stay humble about it. Help the people who cannot possibly ever conceivably pay you back. Help the people who need it. You want to throw a feast? Fine. Invite all those poor people. Invite all those crippled people. Invite all those widows and orphans and all of this. Invite all of these people because they're not going to be able to repay you. But you're like, yeah, but if I, but if I invite this person, they're going to invite me to their house and we're going to have the really good food and the really good wine instead of the cheap swill I can have. And Jesus says, uh-uh, you got everything backwards. You've got everything twisted. The thing that you're supposed to do is to serve people. And the bottom line is, you can't honestly be about serving. You can't honestly be about the kingdom of heaven if you think you're in first place. And the fact is, we're not in first place. We're not in first place on the basis of that, the fact that we are all sinners. That we are not the masters of our own destiny. That we cannot obtain our own salvation. There is nothing we can do to merit salvation. We can't bake enough cookies. We can't sell enough baked goods. There is nothing we can do. We can't hand out enough pamphlets or all of these things in order for God to check off uh, from God's cosmic checklist. Okay, you've done all of the things. You've gotten the achievement. Achievement unlocked. Ticket to heaven. It doesn't work that way. Instead, how it works is God says, I love you. Your sins have been forgiven. Get right. That's it. That's the transactional nature. And so when we see God saying, I love you, you start to think, okay, well, what has God done for me? Well, God helped me out through this time. God helped me out through that time. God took my sins. God took my punishment. God bled and died for me. All of the things that I have done wrong, gone, vanished in the blink of an eye. Because I know who I am. I want to be the hero of the story. But I'm not. At best, I'm the anti-hero. You know, the, the person who tries to do good, but is still kind of a scoundrel. At worst, I'm the antagonist of the story, the one opposing the protagonist, the one who is constantly the foil, preventing the good guy from getting done what the good guy needs to get done. And that's because of my sin. And that's because of our sin. And to realize what God has done about that, Make, you have to be humbled by it. Because God didn't have to do all that God has done for us. Instead, God says, I love you. God takes us from that lowest seat. From the lowest point, the furthest we can be away from God, God takes us, picks us up, and puts us in this place of honor, not because of anything we've done, and certainly not because we deserve it, but simply because God loves us. So we, as people, are left with a choice. Realizing what God has done for us. 
realizing everything God has done for us. We need to decide what we are going to do. We can continue to trod on with our heads held high, being the masters of our own destiny, being the people who will do whatever we want to do, or we can humble ourselves before the Lord and say, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me be? Who would you have me serve? Based on what God has done for us, we have no choice but to change, to be transformed, to be configured and molded into the image of Christ. God has already done great and mighty things for us. But we have to start with a reality check, with remembering who God is and what God has done. And in doing so, we can work together to bring more glory and honor to God. Amen.